Tess Anderson, and this is our video on the history of Tessus. This is June Cummings, secretary of Captain Muir School. So, Mrs. Cummings, we want to know, when did you move to Tessus? Well, I first moved to Tessus when I was about 14. Went to school here. And I left um, when I graduated. I uh, worked for a few years, and I got married, and came back. Um, I've been married 26 years now. Oh, wow. <laughs> what actually attracted you to come back to Tassos? Well, come back to Tassos? Yeah. Well, because my husband worked here, so this was where we were going to live. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, could you describe the development of CMESS over the years that you've worked here? Well, I guess when I went to school, it was just um, it was a little fourplex that's down by the hospital. That was the high school. And the elementary school was up on School Hill. Um, that high school, we only had like four rooms, and one of the rooms was used as a library until they moved a mobile on the grounds, and then that was the library. Uh, we didn't have computers, so we didn't have sewing classes, we didn't have an IE shop. Um, I guess it was after I graduated, they brought in cooking classes, and they did that at the, at the church, United Church. And then when this was built in 71, it was just the high school that was built first. So there's been a real change here with, of course, the computers and the, the IE shop. And then it was the elementary was built on that. Okay, um, do you think the amalgamation would have been to the school's advantage or not? I don't think it would have been an advantage, no. Why do you think that? Why? Because um, I think we would have been, we would have had less money given to us to operate the school. I think we would have been left out through field I think. We would have forgotten about it. Go to the secretary. Okay. Thank you very much. The first school in the In 1949, the small school at the foot of the school hill burned down. Texas River Elementary was built on top of the hill and consisted of four rooms, with four teachers responsible for nine grades. A man named George Long was appointed to the school board and was expected to take on two jobs, official trustee and secretary treasurer. In 1956, a teacherage was built with four apartments and it was ready the day before school opened that fall. One teacher and family with three children moved in, and the same night it burned to the ground. They started the new one the following spring, and at the same time, the pastor had taken over the combined job of John Long. With the request and full of cooperation of the East Asiatic Company, the school expanded, with the teachers becoming best paid in the province. Around 1957, Hugh Ferguson was school superintendent and he used to come up to Port Alberni at least once a year. In 1959, Ken Tasker went to Victoria to request help in building a program for a secondary school. Because of this, a two-room school was built and completed in November 1959. A teacherage for the secondary school was planned, but at the last minute money was withdrawn by the company. A year later, $25,000 was given and used to build and furnish the science room, which was added onto the school. Owner of Tassus Building Supply. When did you move to Tassus? I moved to Tassus in September of 1970. 27 years ago, almost. Okay. What attracted you to this town? Well, I had been traveling in Europe for a year, and I needed a job and I was a teacher and I wanted to make a lot of money in a short time and there were two school districts in the province or three that paid large isolation bonuses uh, one of them was Atlan up near Whitehorse so I applied there first because they paid you twelve hundred dollars a year which in those days was a lot of money but I didn't get that job and the next highest pay was four hundred and sixty dollars a year which was if you taught in Tassos and I did get this job. Plus, I also looked at the pictures. I'd been to one of these things they used to have when they needed teachers a lot. You'd go to a, a recruiting deal, and the 
various school districts would show you the pictures of their school district and the pictures of Tassus. And Tassus picture of the inlet and the town and the mountain up behind looked really, really spectacular. It looked more like Banff or Switzerland. And I used to be a mountain climber, so I thought this place looked good. So I came. Okay. Um, what do you think was the most important event that has occurred in Tassus since you've been here? Probably, I guess, the then Tassus company divesting itself of the community and turning it into a municipality. It used to be, when I first arrived, it used to be a company town. Everything was owned by the company. The roads, even the roads were owned by the company. It was not policed in the normal way. You didn't have to have a driver's license even to drive here. And you didn't need a driver's license, or a, a license plate on your cars. They had little tiny license plates, about this big, that said Tassus, and there was a number. And you weren't allowed to have a car any bigger than a Volkswagen Bug. That was the largest car you could have. Most of them were smaller than that. So, and that was because the roads were very narrow. And the only way you could get in here was on the Uchuk or Northland Navigation. There was no road at that time. And then in 1972 or 3, something like that, the company got out of the town business, basically. They started to, at any rate, and there became a municipality and a, an elected mayor and all that sort of thing. Before that, there was no elected mayor. The town site and mill manager ran the town. He was the king of the mountain, and he lived up where he lives now, and he was the final authority on everything here. And so that change made a big difference to town. Okay, um, what do you see in the future of Tassus? Well, that's a good question. That's a very scary question when you own something like Tassus Building Supply. Um, it depends on what happens to the forest resource. It depends whether there'll be enough trees to cut to keep the mill going over a period of time. It's very difficult to say. The crystal ball is very, very foggy. You can't really see what's going to happen. Uh, I think if the environmentalists had their way, uh, there are some of them who would like to turn the whole of this area into a park, and there would be very few people living here anymore because the mill would close, because there wouldn't be enough wood to cut. If, on the other hand, they managed to arrange it so that we can still get enough fiber to supply the mill, then it could be here for a very long time. There is enough wood to cut without devastating the country. There's enough wood to cut to keep the mill going for a very long time on a more reduced basis with the value-added mills they're talking about putting in and all that sort of thing. Okay. But whether that happens or not, only time will tell. And not very long time either. Within five years we will probably know what the future will, will hold for the, for the town. Okay. You buy your own business? Yes. But I didn't buy the building supply. I left teaching to go beachcombing because beachcombing seemed like a very romantic sort of a, an occupation. And in fact, we left Tassus for a year and a half. I tell people that I've been here for 27 years, but I got a year and a half off for good behavior. We were uh, in the lower mainland area down near Vancouver and Horseshoe Bay where Bruno Gerussi and people like that shot the beachcomber show on CBC for years and we started beachcombing down there. And then we received an offer to do a contract beachcombing job up here from a friend, and so we came back here a year and a half later, and we've been here ever since. And we, we log, it's actually log salvage is what it is. Beachcombing is the exotic name, but it's really just picking up loose logs all over the inlet. And we did that for 10 years here before we bought the building supply. And we stopped doing that. It was a really good job. There is no better job in the world than beachcombing because you are you really are your own boss. There's no customers in the same sense that there are in a retail store. But in those days, Sandpoint, which is six miles down the inlet, used to be a huge log sorting ground and all the logs that were logged in, in this area, and there was a lot more logging and a lot more trees were cut down back in those days, and they were all assembled at Sandpoint. And there were dozer boats and people with pike poles running around on logs sorting the logs, and as they sort them and drag them around on flat booms, where the logs are just one deep, they tended to 
get loose and they would drift around and beachcombers like myself would pick them up and bring them back to the company. But as time went by, logs became worth more and more money and the companies weren't willing to risk losing them as they did and have them sink or get loose and be brought back by beachcombers. So they began to bundle the logs in what they call bundle booms. And bundles are very large and they don't tend to leak out. They don't get out of booms very easily. And then they got log barges and the log barges would pick the logs up right from a pond near where they were logged, put them on the barge and take them to Vancouver or up to the mills. And they don't fall off log barges very often either. And then on top of that, they made dry land sorting grounds like the one down at West Bay. And each logging camp had its own dry land sorting ground so that all the logs were sorted on dry land with a big logs, log loader and they shuffled them around all over and they only put them into the water when they're already in a bundle. So instead of all these loose logs lying around and drifting all over the place, there was a time when you couldn't drive down Tassel in a boat without hitting a log at least once or twice a year. It was guaranteed and a lot of people, in fact, just before I first came in 1970, um, a family lost their lives in winter because they hit a log and it knocked the uh, leg off their boat and they swam to shore but they froze to death just before Christmas. It was very sad. Um, but nowadays, of course, you can drive all the way from here to Friendly Cove or all the way up to New Chapels and never see a single log floating and that's because they're all sorted out in dry land and bundle boomed and log barts here and there so it's it's kind of sad in a way. It's, it was a way of life that was really, really great. You got, she got paid for driving around in boats and scrambling around on the beach and doing the kind of thing that a lot of people would pay good money to do and yet we were paid to do it. But that came to an end. There's a few beachcombers still but it's it's no longer the good deal it was and it wasn't making any money and so we got out of the business and went into the business of selling widgets at the building supply, which is a completely different thing. Well, thank you very much. The village on the west coast side of Vancouver Island. It has about 900 residents, of which 200 are students at Captain Mears Elementary Industry Town, based upon the lumber mill. Ships come in from overseas and export our lumber. Big passes come through a mountain, Tashi, meaning gateway or passage. In this case, the passage is to the Tassus and Nimkish Valley. The Mauchit spent their summers in Friendly Cove and their winter here in Tassus. Today, the Mauchit have always lived in Nootka Sound, and archaeologists confirm a pattern of unbroken settlements dating back to 4,300 years. Excavations have been done at Euclid or Friendly Cove, and a Each family group had its own pai, or headman. Before winter began, they got together in areas such as Mashley, Hoy, Kupki, and Tassus. These get-togethers formed loose confederacies, usually run by one or more Tai. Friendly Cove is such a confederacy that to this day, its main Tai has the title of McQuinnis. For the Mao Chat, life was profitable because of trade, and food was very plentiful in Friendly Cove. They were confident that if they did all the necessary rituals, that the land would look after them. Then came the white man to alter their lifestyle forever. Today, the Nootka call themselves the New Chalna meeting all along the mountain when describing those indigenous to the west coast of Vancouver Island, or Mauachat, when referring it specifically to those who live in Friendly Cove. Supervisor in the Tassel Mill. All right. All right. Um, could you describe what brought you to live in Tassel, please? Well, in uh, 1967, uh, I left back east. We were working on a steel mill back east, and things were pretty rough. There wasn't too much work, and uh, four of us decided <coughs> to come out west here to see if we could get some work. And it happened to be that uh, I was lucky enough to get a job with uh, the old Tassis Company back in September of '67, and I've been here ever since. I worked as a millwright for four years, and then went on to the staff, and have been a maintenance supervisor since 1971. Okay. If possible, could you um, briefly outline how raw lumber goes to finished product in the mill? Well, uh, me being a maintenance guy for the last 30 years in Texas, uh, we had to maintain all the machinery that <coughs> brings logs into the mill and cuts up wood and gets it ready for the ship. 
basically what you have is uh, logs uh, being brought into the mill. The bark is removed for, from them and they travel to the carriage which cuts them into large cants. The cants then are transported into boards by going through edgers or quad saws. They uh, then are taken and graded to different grades of lumber and sorted out in a sorter. Some uh, is directly shipped from that raw lumber and some goes to the planter mill. The planter then finishes the lumber and is put into packages and then taken to dockside and shipped. Uh, everything goes overseas. All right. In your opinion, what makes Tassis unique when compared with other one industry towns such as Gold River? Well, it's hard to, to say what makes it unique, but uh, one thing comes to mind that uh, when I came here first, there was 32 different nationalities of people that were living in Tassis, which I think is unique in any part of the country, you know, and no matter where you go, there's sure there's different, Canada's made of, of different nationalities, but Canada, or Tassis, was definitely unique to me with 32 nationalities of people here. Okay. What is your advice to mill workers who are unsure of their jobs? Well, I was raised in Northern Ireland and uh, I was raised in the, in the 50s and unemployment was running around 21 percent. It was very difficult to get a job at that time and I was very lucky to get an apprenticeship uh, and things are basically like that here in Tassis right now, where it's difficult uh, to get jobs. As it used to be very easy to get a job here in Tassis. But uh, what I would say to anybody that is, well, I can't get a job, you got to try. You really have to try. Sell yourself. And also, be like the Indians used to do. When all the buffalo sort of moved out of one area, they followed the buffalo to another area. So what I'm saying to you is that there's no work in Texas, go elsewhere and work for it. There's work up north, there's work in Australia, New Zealand, Africa, all over the place. I don't think Texas is the only place in the world. Okay. What steps will the mill take to secure its future? Well, what the mill has done, they are right in the process of uh, just about the last stages of spending something like seventy million dollars to modernize the sawmill so as it's going to be here for a long time that it's competitive with other other sawmills. Just to give you an example, Tassis used to uh, produce twenty two hundred board feet of lumber per man. Uh, a modern sawmill today produces about five, six, seven thousand board feet per man. Now, when you're competing with those two, you've got to be somewhere the same. So Tassis, or Pacific, is uh, modernizing, putting in new equipment, uh, making things flow better, making things go faster. Uh, everything like that makes the sawmill. Uh, more, what did you say, profitable, and that's the name of the game. See, well, thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. You're quite welcome. These uh, students here have asked me to say a couple of words about the little number plates we used to have in Tassis. <coughs> when we first come here in 1967, there was no uh, no road into Tassis, and also there was no full-size cars, and they were all very small, tiny little cars, and I guess they didn't want to put a full-size number plate on a tiny little car, but anyway, Tassis had its own number plate, and this happens to be one of them. Uh, I think one of the very last ones that was uh, produced. Anyway, that's uh, Tassis' number plate. Thank you. Without logging, there was small independent outfits, small A-frame rigs along the coastal track of, of timber. When one area was cleared, they moved on to the next area. Their operations had no permanent base. A company named Nooka Woods Products considered building a mill at the head of Cassis Inlet. 
making natural name for the area of Fort Cass. However, Nuka changed its mind and instead built a mill at McBride Bay in 1937. The first large mill at Cass's was started in February 1945 under Gordon Gibson. Construction was rushed because orders needed to be filled quickly. As a matter of fact, by the time the civil engineer arrived with the actual plan, the mill was nearly completed. Gibson himself called it a haywire operation. Since packaged lumber was not developed, it took four days to load the first ship, the Tipperary Park, by hand. On July 5, 1948, the first mill burned down. East Asiatic Company formed a partnership with the Gibson Brothers to rebuild it into the mill we know today. This concludes our video. Thanks for watching.